going live, going live, we are going live, we're going live. Hello everyone, how are we doing today? Now, I have to say, I often find the various images that come through when I'm watching this on the screen ever so slightly less defined than what I think I'm broadcasting. I'm never quite sure what that is with the joyous thing that is XSplit, but I am surprised to be recording, ex exporting this in uh, 190 times 1080, uh, 1920 by 1080 at uh, 30 frames per second. So, without much further ado, let's get into this. And it is Ruse de Guerre, or Deception Disguises and Decoys in Naval Warfare. Now, honestly, this is a mahusive subject. And I wanted to start off with a bit of a discussion about some of the rules and that, the applications of it. And I found this excellent paper written in 1989 by Mary T. Hall, who is a judge in the U.S. Navy. False Colours and Dummy Ships, the Use of Ruse in Naval Warfare. Published summer, 18, uh, summer 18, 1989 in the Naval War College Review by the U.S. Naval War College, and uh, you can find its uh, URL, etc., written down there. Please go look it up. It's an absolutely really fun paper to read and really interesting. Now... Hello, George Newman. Hello, Constantinus. Hello, Bijan. Hello, Roland Cash. Hello, Michael Cooch. Hello, HMS Verdun. Hello, Jonathan Burrow. Hello, Bijan. Hello, do, 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 96 everyone. Yes, there was a bit of, uh, there was supposed to be a up to a 15 minute delay because I was rebuilding the internet. So, we are crossing fingers and hoping everything works. And I am dealing with the fact that, again, it's very clear on my screen here, which is the XSplit screen, and looks a bit fuzzy on the on the YouTube screen. I'm never quite sure why. I don't know why it looks it looks perfectly clear and almost HD here, but looks fuzzy there. So I'm hoping it's good for you all. It might just be the way the YouTube's retreat are repeating it to me. I was looking forward to the questions you'll all be answering asking. Ah. <laughs> uh. I knew it was a classic ruse the delayed start. Um, well, you know, always keep your always keep people guessing. Always people get you guessing. It was more a case of I had a corgi in here helping me earlier with the painting, and the corgi decided to amuse themselves by disconnecting all the cables as I put them in. So this place is still being finished. And most of the, all the stuff basically because of me wanting to get the books out of Threat of Storm and the electronics out of Threat of Storm. Everything that's come back in here can come back in here. But I've still got to finish fixing this part and all that up there. And I've also been doing writing articles and book proposals and all sorts of things. So I've been having fun. <laughs> There is only one of me, as I keep trying to explain to people, but they keep forgetting that. They keep forgetting there's only one of me. I know, it's because I'm so pretty. They think there must be more than one. Hello, John Sykes. Okay. <laughs> 
<laughs> I was once ordered a Coke at McDonald's in Japan was served an iced coffee. I was disturbed on multiple levels. I can understand that. Off topic, as you all seen what I said yesterday, saying why the RN couldn't get the USE2, so why do you believe the RN get, get Hawkeyes when cost and size are against them? Because there is an advantage to buying the same aircraft as both the US and the French are operating. And it's more than just politics. Hi, Senna Canera. Hi, DG40. Hi, Alistair Shaw. Hi, Felix B. Hello, Lions. Hello, Tanifelica. Hello, Jess P. Hello, everyone. Let's see. Hello, Alistair Shaw. Looks nice here. Mm. Glad it's looking good for you, all of you. The Corgi is funny. The Corgi is very funny. The Corgi is very, uh, very, very funny. Uh, no, he is now, technically, he is no longer the trainee assistant fluffy research assistant. He is now the assistant fluffy research assistant. So he's the Afra. Come on, Garen. Will the deception cover things like explosive coal act, or would that be a separate sabotage vid? That'd be a separate sabotage vid. Kind of at least not a smuggy. Uh, it was almost a sm It was also a sm almost a smoggy. Almost. Other wait, what? Participated rebuilding the shed. Yes, the fluffs have been participating and assisting in rebuilding the shed. Also, I can add something else to it. The corgi has decided when it was very hot that he could fit inside the fridge. He is most disturbed to find that my fridge mostly contains iron brew. In fact, I'll be quick. I'll I'll, I'll just be sort of quick and uh, and straight that to you all, because I know you'll want to see proof of this discussion now. So here we go. Da 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 da. The fridge, and as you can see, mostly iron brew and some squash, but mostly iron brew. I can confirm it can accommodate up to six bottles of iron brew in there. Which is useful. <sighs> nice second. £25,000 for one E2 is a bit much. Hmm. That's oh, true. I'm sorry. I mean, why are you building the shed? Um, I decided it needed a paint job. Starters. Uh, it also needed some. So uh, I had to rebuild the entire floor because the builders had rebuilt it, relayed it three times when they were building it. Me and Drac had done our best to shore it up, but after a while, it came to the point at which it needed to be sealed and covered over to protect it. So I sealed it, covered it with actually with con with self leveling uh, concrete floor, and I've covered that with carpet, carpet tiles. So it's now nice and protected, protected, and my whole floor level has risen by somewhere in the region of once you've got the sealant, the concrete, and the tiles, it has risen by somewhere in the region of twenty millimeters. There was a ledge at the door, which was above the floor level by about two centimeters, which is now level with the floor level. So, anyway, have you read Temeraire, the series about a dragon air force in the Polonian times? Nope. Hello, Wandering Chandler. Hello. This uh, will involve, there is literally Atlantis and Cormoran are mentioned. There is literally a slide on them. So, we are going to be talking about Ruse de Guerre, and we're going to start off with the earliest example of it, the Battle of Salamis. And why is this the ex earliest example? Because, honestly, it's difficult to work out some accounts whether or not they are they were doing the, uh, they were doing these sort of things, but in this scenario, the 
Athenian-led Greek fleet, which you will notice does include Spartans and various other allies, leads the Persians into a confined space. Now, why do they do this? Because they have a much smaller fleet, and if they go out and attack the Persians, they will be outnumbered, and the Persians will be able to turn their sides and come in. So they use the fact of one force retreating up this narrow channel. The Persians, and especially the Phoenicians, <coughs> come in. Uh, the Egyptians sort of draw, but the Ionian Greeks and the per um, Phoenicians come in, and they can no longer use their numbers. They are now deep, but they're no longer as wide. So their narrower front means less of their force can actually get through. And you have to remember that ships are not like land campaigns where you can feed, especially this is what the Roman army will later become famous of, feeding reinforcements through to the front line in a constant cycle of bringing fresh people to the front. So a narrow front makes sense. Ships, you would have to feed a whole ship through. And the only way a ship's really getting through is if you can withdraw one ship, but it's very difficult to do that. So basically, once the ships are in line, they're fighting until they're sunk, and then it's fighting the next one. So this is the Battle of Salamis, and it's the first and one of the more famous examples of using a ruse de guerre. Of using one of those operations you're allowed to confuse and disabuse your enemy. Germans, does the Anglo-German naval treaty count? Not really. <laughs> Sage, I haven't been going that long. Don't worry. So, the Battle of Salamis. Now, what is interesting is when we start going into disguise and decoys in naval warfare, most people will think of false flag operations, but you can do entire things of constructing new turrets, new funnels. In the age of sail, it's all about flags because ships are individual enough as it is that it's kind of difficult. Yes, the British have a sort of national standard of the colouring of their ships, but it's a sort of national standard because... If you're on a distant station and you can't get the right amount of paint in the right colour and the right paint in the right amount in the right colour, you aren't going to care much because you're going to care more about protecting your ship and the paint is important for its protection. That's why you're painting the ship to help stop the wood rotting and being corroded and damaged. Now, interesting question you have from Joseph Fox said, the Greeks controlled the combat with which to only fight a fraction of the Persian fleet. Why did the Persians not board their own ships to get to the fight? It was very a very difficult manoeuvre to do that, and they didn't manage to do it. They just didn't manage to do it. As sure, fake gun ports on merchant sailors. Sometimes, often real gun ports on merchant ships. Often real gun ports on merchant ships. And there's a reason they'd have the real gun ports. That was how they would scare people off. And the difference between a merchant ship and a pirate ship was often not that far in between. However, and this is the point that's always worth remembering, the merchant ships very rarely had the number of crew which even a British man of war, i.k.a. a British warship, would carry. And the British rarely had the same number of crew as a French or Spanish ship carried. Uh, Darren Sorotsky and uh, Abzansky, Abbot Zablinsky. Uh, 
Harrison, I say this only slight to Harrison, but I thought Warfare was supposed to be chivalrous and sporting like. It's one of those interesting things about Warfare is that one person's evil deception is another person's, oh, well, that succeeded rather well. We should probably do that again. And it often depends on perspective. I, if you win thanks to something, it's a great idea and really worthwhile doing. If you are the loser because of something, it's evil and nasty. For example, I'm fairly sure the Persians went off of this and said, those dishonorable Greeks, they didn't come out to fight us properly. They just hid and cowered behind the headland. Well, that's true. But also, you didn't have to be the idiot and go in after them. Hello, Andrew Paul. This is the other option. You can be an you can not be an idiot. Um, touch two, Rochelle. There were a class of merchant ships. Yeah, I'm going to be getting into them. There are two classes of Rochelle like that. There are the British Q ships, which are flower class sloops, which often do that role and look very like much like merchant ships. But also, the Germans have their own ships built for World War Two. Usually, what the merchant ships also would do is put carronades in their gun ports. So, Rus de Guerre. Well, in ancient Greek, this was often comes from a stratagem, or acts of generalship. So, basically, the idea was that if you were a general, you were supposed to come up with these things. The idea that we often have of history, especially ancient history, of these people forming up in nice orderly rows and just trying to push at each other, and people like... Alexander the Great, etc., being these unusual things because they try and do something different is a bit misleading. Because whilst wars might really end up, especially Greek wars, with a lot of hoplites uh, forming up their nice sort of basically walls of spears and advancing on each other, mm, there's often a lot more going on than just that. Sun Tzu would put it, All warfare is deception, therefore, when capable, feign incapacity. When active, inactivity. When near, make it appear that you are far away. When far away, that you are near. Offer the enemy a bait to lure him, feign disorder, and strike him. When he is strong, avoid him. Anger his general and confuse him. Pretend inferiority and encourage his, his arrogance. To quote from the, again, mentioned document at the beginning, but they cited this one, the NWP-9, Commander's Handbook of the Law of Naval Operations. Law of armed conflict permits deceiving the enemy through stratagems and ruses of war intended to mislead him, deter him or from taking action or to induce to act recklessly provided the rules. The ruses do not violate rules of international law applicable to armed conflicts. So, that's actually quite a broad spectrum. Sorry. Speaking of the assistant fluffy research assistants. Keep coming in. <sighs> so, right. Now. This means it's now so accepted, it's part of the laws of rules and laws of war that ruses are accept, uh, accepted. But the fact is they've been around a very long time. I pointed out Salamis earlier, which is thousands of years ago. So, as a result, why are they still working? Why is your opponent not expecting you to be doing something like this? Well, the problem comes down to a base point. If you think your enemy is doing nothing, and all your information says they're doing nothing, and you react as if they're doing something and it turns out to be doing nothing, you'll waste a lot of troops, you'll waste a lot of resources when nothing's happening. And as we all know, war is one great big logistics challenge. War is one great big 
what do you have available when do you have it available and that's what you're going to be able to fight the war with so you have to marshal your resources carefully you have to harbor them carefully if you use them too freely and too quickly you won't have anything left to fight the war this is why order is the gear matters so much this is why what you do matters so much because war at its base point is all the judgment call i know there are people who like to say we can make modern warfare all about science we can make it a scientific contest where everything will be perfectly zeros and ones but all you need to do be is the opponent who's prepared to be illogical the opponent who's prepared to not always do the what's best to fight for a different set of goals and aims than necessarily you've programmed your computer and you are facing a real problem it's the same with dealing with rose de guerre if a ship looks like a duck quacks like a duck you're going to presume it is a duck not a swan Sissy's lost you. <laughs> oh. So the assistant fluffy research assistant is managing to cause consternation in the family because they were wondering where he was. I came to see Papa. Now. <laughs> yeah. Um, this fox, how could the Persians have won Salamis then? The blo uh, blockade the Greeks to force them out? To be fair, what they could have done is sent in fire ships to force them out and then sat, sat outside waiting for them to come out to them. Either way, they end up in trouble if fire ships are coming in. Interesting discussion going on about iced tea. Hi, Stafford. No worries. Glad you found some more gold. Our Duckle 95, how did Daniel Pollux? It's interesting that so many documents spell out that Ruse de Guerre are allowed. The MD Manual of Law of Armed Conflict also spells it out. Yes, I have to admit, I tried to avoid using British sources because we do it rather too often. And in fact, almost the British way of war should probably have a couple of chapters in title in it stating Ruse de Guerre, Ruse de Guerre, and Ruse de Guerre. Yeah, British way of war. Just realized there's a book which, when I was reorganizing everything, I didn't find in here, which means it's probably somewhere else. That sounds a good thing. That's a corgi and not a white Persian cap. <laughs> uh, I would have you know the corgi is probably smarter and scarier. Because their whole ruse de guerre is that they don't look smarter and scarier. And there's another thing which is now wandering around the garden, which fulfills that to a T as well. John Sykes. Oh, yeah. That's, hang on, I think I've missed a question. And speaking of other things. Hello. Uh, <clears throat> so anyway, you sure you didn't concrete over the book? I'm positive I didn't concrete over the book. I'm sure positive I actually now know where it is. <laughs> Very good song, Stafford. John Sykes, I, I always think of the movie on the Grass Bay where the German admiral tells the British merchant ship captain that they often use disguises. Yes, and that's perfectly fine as long as the moment they start fighting, they snap up the German flag.
Interesting. How's the cheat to not get caught? Yes. Uh, I mean, Operation Instinct is proof of that. Oh, well, it works. It's legitimate. Although the movie is very interesting compared to reality. Colin Cameron, why did your speech about tactics keep flashing up images of Commander that stalemating uh, as a stratagem in my mind? Data, uh, Commander Data stalemating as a stratagem in my mind. Because that's exactly the case. When you are dealing with an opponent, you have to, uh, you cannot presume that their end goal is the same as your end goal. For example, <sighs> the end goal of this fluffy creature is different than the other fluffy creature, isn't it? Both have similar aims, mostly maximize their acquisition of food. But they have different uh, they have different goals for what that food is and what it takes form of. This one likes pickies. The other one, very, very keen on main meals. And today was trying to go off my Taco Bell. There's a does your mother have the book? Potentially. She has about six of my books currently next to her in her seat. So back to real time. That was a hectic ride. Thought I'd see a corky in the fridge. No, no, no. He tries to get in there, but no. <laughs> this is a boxer. The British Way will pay everyone else to fight for you. Well, it's worked throughout history. Sorry, just found a scab on the fluff and checking it out to check it's okay. What do you do to yourself? The French invaded the Bruchac. No, not French. Austrian. <laughs> like many, many things, many products from Austria are great at pretending that are great in history of pretending they're not from Austria. Uh, it's Ruse de Guerre French. Ruse de Guerre is French. Uh, if we're going to sit on this. Yeah. Ooh! Wasn't Ruse de Guerre basically used in the Washington Naval Treaty and on Naval Treaty? That's not really technically a ruse of war. That's technically a ruse de plan. I think I'm pronouncing it right. Basically, a uh, ruse of diplomacy. Um, Bijan, you might claim wearing a big dog is not wise, but you know, the big dog disagrees. <laughs> Croissant, that's all. Hello, it was from Australia. Oh, yeah. Hello, hey, Greg. Right then, so, this is an interesting battle, and this is where I could end up getting a lot of random people coming and checking in on me. Because I'm going to say this. This is where the real-life Jack Sparrow dies. In the Battle of Cape Lopez. And the Battle of Cape Lopez is interesting because... It's the death of Barthoymi Roberts, who is one of those pirates from the Golden Age of Piracy. Now... He is, he is killed by a ship operating under Charles Ogle, Cap at that time Captain Charles Ogle, or Ogle, who will go and become an admiral of fleet, and who serves in the Nine Years' War, the War of the Spanish Succession, the War of Jenkins' Ear, it has all sorts of experience, and is... Um, hmm. Fairly successful... Fairly successful. He is the admiral who presides over the court martial of the captain's accused of cowardice at the Battle of Toulon, 
and was commander in chief in the Noir at one point. The Noir, yeah. And famously, Ogle is buried at St Mary's in Twickenham. Now, why is the Battle of Cape Lohas a ruse de guerre? Well, here's what happens. Roberts had managed to capture over 400 vessels, ranging from fishing boats to large frigates. He was known as Black Bart and was one of the most successful officer, uh, pirates of his age. He'd even captured a uh, French 52-gun frigate, which had had the governor of the French colony aboard. Now, the problem was, because he decided to kill the governor, which was probably stupid because he was connected to court, the British and the French actually both sent ships and forces out after him. Now, Robert managed to capture Robert, uh, two of the French warships again, and including the 16-gun Comte de Toulouse, Toulouse and the 10-gun brig. The Toulouse was renamed the Ranger, and the brig, the Little Ranger. He then went and sailed off to Monday Gabon. He captured the Royal Africa Company frigate, the Onslow. Now, again, the Royal Africa Company is another of those things like the East India Company, uh, the East India Company and the Hudson Bay Company and the Falkland Islands Company at a sort of point. Uh, you know, it's one of those big monopolistic mercantile trading companies. And they have their own ships. They have a frigate. That mounted over 40 guns and can, crew consisted of 250 personnel, both recruited in Africa and Europe. So, yes, multinational crew. However, he ended up needing, to this point, repair his ship. So, he took to, went to Cape Lopez for careening. It's a good place to get the ships out of the water to careen and repair them. This is necessary if they're going to be fast. Remember, pirate ships have to be fast because they're like all service freighters. Their life depends on speed, on their ability to get away if they find a bigger threat. In this area, HMS Swallow and HMS Weymouth were on patrol. Swallow was commanded by Cap the then Captain Sharna Ongle. Now, Ogle sailed round the Cape. He sighted four vessels. Three of them pirates and one a merchant ship, which belonged to, ne uh, were called Neptune, and belonged to a guy called Captain Hill, which was illegally trading with the pirates. Again, another reality of being a pirate life is Again, as merchant supply ships. Kind of like what the Kriegsmarine under the Nazis decided to do in the Second World War, where you had the Ultimark sailing around and various other supply ships. You need supply ships. You cannot just have your ship operating on its own. It's going to need some form of supplies. That might be food. That might be rum. That will most likely be a lot of rope and canvas and tar and all sorts of other things which you need to be able to get hold of. And probably some specific types of wood as well. Now, Ogle spots a sandbar, this is the official story, and turns out of the way and raises a Portuguese flag. The way he turns, though, is a not at all, described as not at all naval-like. It's slovenly. It's almost like a small crew. And as surprisingly, mm, the pirates decide that this must be a fleeing merchant vessel. Portuguese merchant vessel. Remember, this is a Royal Navy ship flying a Portuguese flag here for the younger pirates. So Robert sends off his next most senior captain, James Scrim, in the Ranger, remember that 16-gun sloop of war, formerly known as the Comte de Toulouse, to capture the merchant ship, uh, this fleeing merchant ship. Ogle let the pirate chase him for several hours until they were far enough away from the Cape 
the land was longer, no longer in sight, and therefore they were also out of hearing range. This was important because what he was about to do was going to matter, and it would make a lot of noise. And what he did was he turned the belt, pretending again to have more trouble, and waited until they were almost in cannon, uh, cannon range, snapped up the white ends in, and blasted away like Merry Talio with everything he got. So for, surprisingly, a relatively short action, I can't think why, a 50-gun mm, fourth rate versus a very, a, a nice little, you know, 16-gun sloop. I can't think why that was a short action. Um, the sloop was captured, made a prize, and ten pirates were killed. Ogle then sailed back to the Cape Lopez. He arrived there on the 10th of February, 1722. At this point, when they arrived back, Hill and Roberts, remember Captain Hill was that merchant captain, um, were having breakfast aboard the Royal Fortune when one of his crew shouted that Ranger was returning from chase with the mer uh, from a chase of the merchant ship again. Ogle has kept the captured pirate vessel with him. So it adds to this idea of they are the captured ship returning. Not a warship return coming in, a captured merchant ship, fat with prizes. At this point, one of the pirates, who a man named Armstrong, who had absconded from Weymouth, which was Swallow's sister ship at Madeira, recognised the frigate and told Roberts. Roberts, living up to his status as the real-life Jack Sparrow, boarded his ship, the Royal Fortune, dressed in his finest clothing, a red damask waistcoat, apparently, with red feather in his hat, and began organising for an escape. The crew from the Little Ranger were ordered to join the crew of the Royal Fortune, so as to keep as many pirates as possible aboard the flagship for defence. The Ranger, was, which was hauled on her side, being cleaned at the time, was abandoned. Captain Kill's crew, therefore, went aboard the Little Ranger and looted gold and other valuables, and sailed off for Prince's Island to try and get uh, getting themselves away while Robert's plan decided to sail directly for the Swallow in order to par quickly pass her and then escape. Uh, the aim was to do this so quickly that Swallow would have to turn about to engage or chase the Royal for Fortune, which would give Robert's time to flee. It has one small problem in that it allows the Swallow to de deliver one of its broadsides. It has one advantage because it only allows them to deliver one broadside and therefore gives you maximum time for getting away. However, when Royal Fortune was off the Swallow's beam, Swallow released a full broadside, raking the ship. The pirates opened fire but a second broadside from the Swallow managed to rake the deck. And Black Bart was commanding from the deck and got hurt. The pirates got clear and ran ahead of the wind, leaving Swallow behind. And unfortunately, there was also a, tra a tropical storm just about to take place. Uh, just sort of about to take place. And Royal Fortune was going to escape and then went into the eye of the storm and were becalmed for half an hour, which allowed the swallows the time to catch up. And when they were in range, they fired their swivel guns, which were mounted with grape shot. This is what killed off Bartholomew Roberts. A piece of shot no bigger than a penny hit him in the throat, severed his spinal column, and he died instantly. Now, 
The pirates at this point decided to t slow down their vessel and get it and avenge their captain. Um, but they were unsuccessful in fighting it off. There is a dispute as to whether Ogle allowed um, allowed Roberts's crew to bury him, sea, him at sea. Ogle seems to think, uh, Ogle seems to have let them do it, not bothered by it, rather than taking the uh, the body home. He always seems to have portrayed that as being rather disturbingly sick to bring the body home. But there's also some people who claim that the during the action, the pirates managed to sew up Bartholomew Roberts in all his clothing and get him off the ship and bury him at sea that way. Either way, he's dead. Um, 272 pirates taken prisoner. Many of the wounded die on their, uh, died in captivity on their way to the prison of Cape, uh, Cape Coast Castle. Uh, 54 pirates were hanged. 37 were punished less severely than that. 65 were former African slaves that Roberts had emancipated. And for their crime, uh, for their crime of being caught doing piracy, they are slowed back into slavery. Um, 17 went to Marshall Sea Prison in London. 20 became indentured serv servants for the Royal African Company. Uh, dozens of pirates escaped punishment as they were forced into a life with Robert's pirates to begin with, is what they claimed. They claimed they'd been forced to serve as a pirate, which is always an interesting thing if you consider the realities of piracy. Oh, yes, we forced you to serve and then we gave you a loaded weapon. Oh, really? Ogle himself was knighted and took several ounces of gold dust from the ranger and the Royal Fortune. Captain Hill managed to escape completely with the rest of the gold. Always not good to be a merchant ship. And <laughs> Hi, Greg. Hello, Greg. Hello, QB4472. Hello, Shumi. Okay, let's see. Come around. Too bad Robert's crew were too drunk at the time to get away. That was part of the trouble. They were significantly drunk. Uh, JC, the stream audio sounds particularly good today. Very crisp and clear. Whatever, whatever you did, it's good. I'm not sure what I've done, but basically I have... The microphone is now in the center of the room, so it's this side of the computer, whereas traditionally it was that side of the computer. So I'm wondering if perhaps the harmonics work better when it's in this side of the room. Hi, you go, Lana. That's what, did they sort of fight the Avenger, uh, Avengers to Captain or because they couldn't get away having been becalmed? I think it's more likely the latter than that. Uh, you know, it is the honorable, most honorable and noble tradition of pirates to run away when they come, come, they come against superior force. I don't. I think slowing to fight to avenge their captain sounds better than we were becalmed. It certainly sounds braver and more. You know, oof, we're brave warriors. Really? Yes, you are. We'll, we'll accept that. But it's kind of like my poodle's a brave warrior. Very brave warrior. He tends to be behind me. Tends to be. Hi, going through it. 
I'm sorry, could it be cool to switching a Prince Jürgen and Bismarck prior to a demonstrator's ruse again? Well, it's certainly designed to try and confuse your enemy. It doesn't really work that much, but it's, you know, it's an idea. I think before I open another bottle of Iron Brew, I will quickly have a glass of squash, because otherwise the squash is going to go off. How much is, like, Captain Hill treated? Well, you see, Captain Hill didn't do anything bad, technically, apart from make a lot of money. And as long as he didn't actually engage in piracy himself, he paid his taxes and was a good law-abiding member of a community, um, they tended to get away. If they became actual pirates, then they had trouble. Yes, the cog is wrapped up, and the reason it's wrapped up is that's protected it while moving it around, because I knew I was going to be doing this in the office, so keeping it wrapped up kept it safe while everything was being moved around. Hmm. You want something, don't you? You do. You're looking at me like this, and you're going, I have done... What mighty duty have you performed for your papa that deser means you deserve something? And just being beautiful does not deserve you something. You feel it does. Okay. You do realise your mummy is worried that you're going to get a podgy fluff. Although, when you don't eat your dinner, she then complains to me and goes, I don't know, I'm worried he's not eating properly. And I don't have the heart to tell her that he's tried to eat his body weight in biscuits. Mm-hmm. Wondering, Shannon, what are any diplomatic consequences of a ruse during the age of cell? I know the Japanese complained about German raiders disguising them as Japanese merchants while marauding. Um, not really. Because you had to prove it. And it could be said, oh, they didn't see properly. Or in this case, it was apprehending a pirate, so the Portuguese won't mind. Portuguese merchant ship. But it is kind of interesting that um, that's exactly what they have it ready to go. So Ogle had obviously been planning this sort of scenario. They had the... They had... Let's put it away. There are certain parts of that story. Okay, for starters, they had a Portuguese flag aboard. And secondly, the way they handled themselves. But he... he, he it's the same sort of way of, you know, they just accidentally did this, and it was an accidental thing. It wasn't. It was done on purpose. Hmm. Well, Stafford, I am taking very good care of it. In fact, it might end up with a slightly different position, because I might be going to put a shelf up there. Which will be things like safe. John Barrow, my frothy researcher said just tilted his head at body weight in biscuits. <laughs> okay, man, Doc, were they aware that those compelled to serve in Barrow other than weapons were given a vote in managing the crew and part of the bounty? It is a kind of interesting scenario about being compelled to serve in a pirate crew. It's kind of like the number of people who tell me that, um, you know, oarsmen were all slaves on galleys. And I go, not really. <laughs> Karen, would the way the cruisers attack the grass speed be considered deception as the captain initially thought he was dealing with destroyers because of the way the strategy attack? We'll be getting to that. Sean Mack. Hello, Sean. Stafford, you're no longer alone. One doesn't accidentally ho hoist a flag. No. One doesn't, as a rule. Anyway. From this one, we go after the Battle of Pulo Ara, which is 
one of my favourite battles, as you all know. You, if you've, what, I've already done, a, I think, an entire video on this battle. Um, Pulo Aura. Now, this is fought on the 14th, of, 14th and 15th of February, more of the 15th of February, um, 1804. So it's almost, it's almost, it's not really a Valentine's Day battle. But on the 14th of February, a large convoy of the Honorable East Indian Company, East Indian, intimidated and drove off and chased away a powerful French naval squadron. That's how it's often portrayed. And it's pretty simple. Nathaniel de Dance, who's the Commodore in charge of this squad of this convoy, has 29 merchant vessels and a single brig. Charles Lenoir, who is in charge of the French force, has a ship of the line, two frigates, a corvette, and a brig. Now, here is the point. The East Indiamen are not that well armed. They are not fourth, fifth rate ships. And the ships of the line, well, there's the Marengo, which is a 74 gun ship, which is Lunar's flag Lunar, Luni, uh, Lunar's, uh, flagship. The Belle Pool, which has 40 guns. The Semelante, which has 36 guns. The Versio. 20 guns, a ventre, uh, 16 guns. Bursu may have had as many as 28 guns. That's certainly what Dance tried to claim it had, but I think that it's pierced for 20. I think it might have had more mounted on it. The East Indiaman. They, if they carry guns, do not carry that many. When I say they don't carry that many guns, they are mostly about ca carrying supplies. They, in 1804, is probably carrying somewhere in the region of 36 18 pounder guns. And is on her first voyage so yeah 36 18 pounder guns was what the earl of camden which was dance's flagship was carrying i the same armament as semelante the smaller frigate so how do they do it what do they do well, this is known as the China Fleet. It's one of the richest and most significant convoys of the year. It can brings East Indian from China and other Far Eastern ports carrying millions of pounds, and this is 1804 millions of pounds worth of trade goods. The equivalent today would be, I don't know, probably billions upon billions of pounds worth of goods. The out news of the outbreak of war had only just arrived in the Pacific when they were being formed up, and the only available warships to defend the fleet was the brig Ganges from the Honourable East India Company's own fleet. Again, the East India Company, quite a powerful force, they literally have a brig. That's their only warship. You'd think, if anything, especially if you're dealing with a fleet this size, you'd at least have a third rate sitting around. I'm sure the Royal Navy could have built an extra one if they'd offered. But there again, the Royal Navy probably wanted to use it for Royal Navy things, so, you know. The thing is, Lenoir got information from du uh, Dutch sources about the fleet's destination and date of departure from Canton while he was anchored at Batvia in Java. And so he sailed in search of the convoy 
on 20th of December, 1803. Now, this battle takes place in the South China Sea. It is the other side of the world from any support. There is no Royal Navy fleet rushing to assist them. Most of the ships, if they had guns, were not armed with long guns, but were armed with carronades. Powerful, requiring less crew, but shorter range than not as accurate. However, most of them do look like 4th and 5th rates. Mm, you could even go argue with Cavius and the big ones might look like a smaller 3rd rate. They do have two decks. They do look like they are big, and you can paint them to look like they're pierced. They had used a lot of paintwork and a lot of carpentry to make them look like they had dummy cannon and everything else there. Um, and it wasn't pre uh, without pre uh, previous examples. In 1797, an unescorted convoy of East Indiamen had also used uh, similar tactics to intimidate a French squadron to a drawing without a fight. And in 1799, 1799 an attack by a combined Franco-Spanish squadron on a convoy at Macau was driven off in a Macau in incident without convo uh, combat by this force and a, raw, a small Royal Navy escort squadron. And basically the Royal Navy escort squadron was frigates and they acted as if they were frigates signalling to the ships that align East Indiamen. So if you can imagine it, what happens is, as we all know, in a, in a line of battle, the ships line form up, and then the frigates form a go up behind them, and they're signalling and repeating signals. So that's like an admiral. And this is what happens in this fight. Basically, some of the merchant vessels go off, form a line, and they are flying, specifically flying, Instead of red ensigns, flying blue ensigns. Blue ensigns being the flag of the navy. Red being the merchant flag. And they fly these up. And the brig takes its position as if it's repeating signals. And suddenly, you've got the French commander going, Well, those look like ships in line. And they do, it looks to look like more ships than I was expecting in this convoy. And it looks like ships in line. So what do I do? <sighs> and they had an advantage as well. That crap, dance, I mean, was an officer with over 45 years service at sea. So he had not just the authority of being given of being made Commodore, but he also had the status of having had a lot of experience. So when they spot the Nile Squadron, Dance immediately orders the convoy to sort of split up into two. Ganges and the Alfred, Royal George, Bombay Castle, and Hope all form up with him in the Earl Camden and form line to look like they're a detaching escort squadron going to investigate the enemy warships. And then he forms up these ships into a line of battle. So Lenoir's squadron falls in behind the slow line of merchant ships and Dance immediately starts to move around towards them. Herding the merchant ships to keep the large East Indiamen, like the warships, as the warships, you know, what they're looking like, in between the 
French and the Mercian fleet. So they look like warships. They're acting like warships. He's even taken on extra crew from some of the other merchant vessels to in order so their actions would seem more smart and more naval-like. Because Navy ships had more crew than merchant vessels. Lenar himself even writes, If the bold front put on by the enemy in the daytime had been intended as a ruse to conceal his weakness, he would have profited by the darkness of the night to endeavour to conceal his escape. And in that case, should have taken advantage of the news. But I soon became convinced that this security was not feigned. Three of his ships constantly kept their lights up, and the fleet continued to lie too, in order of battle throughout the night. This position facilitated my gaining the wind and enabled me to observe the enemy closely. So, basically... Dance knows he can't escape. He knows his ships won't be fast enough, etc., to escape the French. He can't hide in the sphere. So he keeps the ruse up all night. So much so that Lenoir is always convinced that there were actually warships there. Again, in the 15th of February, they raise the colours. This starts on the 14th of February on Valentine's Day. It raises, carries on the 15th of Cal. Dance tries to persuade Lenoir that his ships included. Uh, were these fully armed warships. And of course, they raise again blue ensigns. The rest of the convoy raises red ensigns, but blue ensigns are as a sign of warships. So these ships are acting like warships. They're looking like warships. They're raising the flags of warships. And at one o'clock, when Lenoir's faster ships are in danger of isolating the rear of the convoy, Dance orders his lead ships to tack these ships, which look like warships, to tack and goes to engage. Aiming to come about so they cross in front of the French squadron, crossing their team. They execute this maneuver. Promptly, smartly. Again, you have officers who have 45 years worth of sea experience in this force. Yes, they're not naval officers, but they know how to handle their ships. And they have full crews, which they don't normally have, but they've got extra crew aboard. They are doing this for their lives. At 1.15, Lenoir opens fire and leadship the Royal George under the command of a captain called John Farm Timnis. Raw George and next four ships in line, including ja Ganges, Dance's Earl Camden, the Wally and the Alfred, all return fire. Captain James Pendergast, in the hope, was so eager to join the battle that he actually misjudged his speed and almost coll and collided with the Wally. The ships falling back as their crews worked to separate their rigging. Shots were then exchanged at long range for 43 minutes, neither side inflicting severe damage. Royal George lost a sailor named Hugh Watt, and another man was wounded. At 2 o'clock, after 45 minutes of fighting, Lenar uh, uh, abandoned the action and ordered his squadron to haul away from the convoy, or under all sail. Dance ordered his, the ship's flying naval ensigns, including his flagship Earl Camden, to chase the French, to continue the ruse. So not only has he just fought a battle, he's continuing the ruse as if he's prepared to fight more. And when I, when I say fought a battle, they ran everything out to look like they had more guns than they did and were firing more and were using extra, extra powder in the cannon to try and create more smoke. I'm not sure if that was really successful, but they were doing their best. For two hours, Dance Squadron followed an art. Hope coming actually itself managed to come close to, ca to catching a Ventura, uh, but ultimately they were unable to overtake it. But there is a scenario where you could have got a French frigate being captured by an East Indiaman, because I have to say this, Pendergast of Hope is an absolute nutter. He has no concept of he is outgunned and out crewed by any of the French ships. As far as he's concerned, he will take you. He's going to hunt you down. <laughs> Just, and this is why the French believe they're warships, because no merchant ship in their right mind behaves like this. <sighs>
By eight o'clock, the entire British convoy anchors at the entrance of the Straits of Malacca. And on the 20th of February, HMS Shepter and Albion, two British ships of the line, join them in the Strait and conduct them safely to St. Helena in the South Atlantic. Basically, they get joined by two uh, two ships line, which go. Um, do you actually need us? Uh, those were two, of course, lovely third rates, and then they're joined by HMS Plantagenet, which escorts them the rest of the way to England. They have fun. Lenoir tries to explain his conduct in the battle by saying the ships had, which attacked and rejoined those which were engaged us and three of the engaging ships maneuvered to double our rear, while the remainder of the fleet, crowding sail and bearing up, invents an intention to surround us. By this maneuver, the enemy would have rendered my situation very dangerous. The superiority of his force was ascertained, and I had no longer to de deliberate, uh, deliberate on the part I should take to avoid the consequences of an unequal engagement. Profiting by the smoke, I hauled to port and steering north east north east, I increased my dis uh, by distance from the enemy, to continue to pursue your squadron for three hours, discharging at it several broadsides. Yeah. As we have been over, these were nutters. Hello, Andy. Hope you're well. A bit of new f uh, news for you. My father, XRN, just got back from Australia. I was seeing my brother. The first thing he did was go to Vampire 2. He took a lot of pics of this. Cool! Gerland, Venetian oarsmen were paid, weren't they? It was a pretty well paid job. Did it change us? Yes, they were. Sir Johnson, the, you said he's in the original Arm Merchant Cruiser. Um, not the original Arm Merchant Cruiser, but they certainly didn't understand the concept of being unarmed. And JC, as I understand that when one's asked to join a pirate crew, declining offer meant death, so I wouldn't call it free and uncoerced decision. No, but there were lots of advantages to being a member of the crew as well. And let's be honest, there are ways of getting away from these situations if you want to. Isn't uh, Daniel Pontus? Isn't a sloop a pretty pathetic uh, ship for a uh, uh, name uh, for name Ganges? It was a uh, honourable East India Company, and so you know that's what they had. Hello, Manning Sixty Forty. Wait a second. What happened to the Iron Brew? Why was he? Uh, I've used up one bottle of Iron Brew, and I have a running. Uh, running rule now, apparently, that when it's hot, I need to drink at least one glass of squash before I open up a second bottle of Iron Brew, or a third, or possibly a fourth today. <laughs> Don't worry, I've got plenty of Iron Brew in the fridge. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck, Jonathan Burrow. I'm not going to repeat that word. <laughs> so, anyway, what's this guy performing a ruse or laughing? Well, it's technically a ruse de guerre. It is technically a ruse of war. He is pretending to be something he's not. He's pretending to be a warship. <laughs> so, dear chat, uh, to ensure an interruption I'm Bruce Blythe, please join the channel. Consider becoming a patron member. Super no. Seriously, Stafford, you're better at that than I am. Um, I will say one thing. We've been having this discussion right, lately a lot amongst uh, various um, uh, account of people who produce military history content on YouTube. And I would say this. If you ever think you are, that someone hasn't produced something lately, go check their channel. Check you're still subscribed because it there does seem to be something interesting going on with the logarithm on YouTube when it comes to naval history and military history content and those sort of things. So that, and I have found that it, it, the one correlation I have worked out with videos is when people more than me tweet them out, 
they get a lot more views, and the algorithm seems to pick that up. And I don't know if YouTube has any links on Twitter and watches the way for people tweeting them. I, I maybe they check for people sharing, not the doing using the share button. I don't know, but if you like a video, please do share it because that helps. There it was. So it was a human corgi. <laughs> he was something. <laughs> Not necessarily. Can't count how many guns we have. We've used them screen over all sides. Pretty much. Um, yes. <laughs> Not necessarily. If it waddles like that, quacks like that, it's probably an Indian. Hmm. I'm round. Enjoy the pizza. Yes, but follow me, Roberts. <laughs> That's good. If I remember correctly, any pirate was free to leave any ship and port, they call that. Mm hmm. <laughs> Thank you, Andy. Um, no, I'm in the shirt. Not to say the best kind of is the right fiction, mate. You know that the real world examples are crazier than I could ever imagine. Well, yes, um, this is the point. These are five ships, of which four are built as merchant ships. Remember, merchant ships are not built as solidly as capital as warships in any way, stretch of imagination. They are carrying supplies. Some of them are even carrying quite dangerous and flammable supplies. They have no more than 36 18-pounder guns each. No more than that in this configuration, this period. And most have less. And they are hunting down ships which have 74 guns. And it, it's basically, it's when you sort of go, well, hang on, there are the, these five ships, how many guns do they have versus how many guns do the French have and the French crews? Yeah, that's really not sensible. Now, Coach, a lot of them think this is bots promoting it, so order to decide to purge your bot accounts, unsubscribing unsuspecting people. It's doing all sorts of weird things. It gets that. Anyway, I have, of course, because we are talking about Cruise de Guerre, I've had to cruise the most famous movie scene of all time in here, which is this. Dawn. First light reveals the results of an overnight transformation from naval warship to a shambolic-looking Portuguese whaler. What is it about the Portuguese flag that the Royal Navy loves so much? Why is it almost every time they're looking for a flag of a nation which they not they can pretend to be, they reach for the Portuguese one? The old alliance, so helpful. The gun walls are painted an untidy okra, and the gun ports hidden behind broad stripes of canvas. Strips of canvas. The sails are black are patched and ragged, the forecastle cluttered with barrels, smoke billows from a Cauldron amidships. On deck and in the rigging, there's a quarter of the normal complement of men, all of them dressed in purses slops. Terrible. Quarter deck at dawn. A bemused Stephen looks about him as he approaches Jack. I see a wolf in sheep's uh, a wolf in sheep's clothing. Jack, a phasmid doctor. It was you what gave me the uh, the idea. Not sure a phasmid can be a predator. No? Well, this one is. Hmm. Potential Danny politics. Uh, YouTube, there are a lot of issues going on at the moment. But it's still a good channel, and as I've said before, this is actually turning into a more reliable income stream, despite it theoretically being my fun thing, than some of the universities I work for. We can all leave that to one side. Uh, that's the joys of being a contract lecturer. 
And a, pin, a, pin, a fleet of Atreus Royal Pindies in the 1800s. Pretty much. Mm-hmm. Doesn't though most pirate ships were a lot more pleasant to serve on than either than even merchant or military ships. The pay was more fairly distributed, punishments weren't as harsh. Yeah, there's advantages. New York was an example, another example of fiction having to make sense. True. You had to make sure you were both something which could be plausibly be there and something which could be plausibly weaker. No, no, no. It seems sensible to me. Even the French engaged in this them, they still don't serve as destruction which may allow the rest of the fleet to effect their escape. Potentially. But uh, going back to the Pula, um, uh, Pula Aura battle, they are... Honestly, that's never in Dance's mind they will have to fight a last stand. His whole thing is they act as ferociously as possible for about an hour and they will drive the French off. What's a phasmid? A phasmid is a type of insect which tends to look like an, uh, something else. I, um, if you're talking about a stick insect, that's a phasmid. Or a species of phasmid. I don't think there could be a uh, part two to um, Gladiator, but I wouldn't mind a part two to Master and Commander. I do think both Crow and Bellamy would be a lot more expensive now, though, than when they did this. That's true. I know Brett Devereux or Koo has said similar things about Patreon being a more reliable source of uh, military funding than universities these days. Yep, Patreon is far more Patreon is far more reliable than other things. Um, honestly, I've been having conversation with my colleagues who have more traditional funding of the, for their research, and some of the issues they're getting. I kind of like Patreon because I've written it, so I know exactly what is being requir required of me and what I'm supposed to do. And it's going to sound strange, but that comes with a lot less, and YouTube subscriptions, all these things, comes with a lot less, um, how do I put this politely? A lot less ties to say you can or cannot do this. One of the things I've found quite interesting when I'm looking at the job market these days, especially for academia, is theoretically the next level up from me in terms of permanent posting. Quite a lot of the research roles are very, very limited in terms of the subjects they're allowing you to research and very, very focused. And it means you, I, uh, there, it, to me, speaks that either they already have someone in mind for the post and they've written that post for them, and they're only advertising it because they have to, which I always find quite upsetting in a way, because, and when I say upsetting, I mean it's upsetting in a frustrating way, because I can see people spending hours, days, writing applications for that role, and if you really have written with a person in mind, there's no chance anyone else is really going to get that role other than that person. Or alternatively, if that per if it's been written in that mind, that person's been told they pretty much got the job, but then if they you end up giving it to someone else, you devastate them. So either way, it's not good. Or alternatively, it's written so tight, you know, it's so heavily prescribed that the moment you apply, you get the role, you can't do anything outside the lines. I've had this conversation with departments, and it's they they are very strict, and it was. I was watching a program the other, recently about one of the last independent scientists was discussed. And independent historians are becoming fewer and fewer. And I'm not sure I would classify myself in a number, but thanks to Patreon and YouTube channel, and the YouTube channel and the, the income I get through these things, I'm far closer to being an independent historian 
than many of my colleagues. So I hear, YouTube is recommending me three year old videos on mass now. Ooh. No worries, Stafford. Andy, Peter, uh, Andy uh, weren't the Indians faster than warships? No, they were often actually slower. Um, the reason they were often slower is because warships were usually copper bombed. Not all in the in the merchant ships were. They usually warships usually had more crews, so it could do a, a larger crew, so it could adjust their sails more easily to get the best out of it, and would often actually carry more canvas. And also, you have to think about where the weight is and the density of a uh, an East Indian fully loaded East Indian versus a warship. If they're not fully loaded, then they are less dense and they can actually get up to a higher speed at some points, but not always. That'd be fun, Darius. Perhaps in the future, if we get enough funds can be gathered, you can build a brew ship, a sailing frigate, or tribal. It would be a tribal class destroyer. It would be built. John Sykes, USS Churchill is authorized by the US Navy to fly the White Ensign. I wonder what the Iron thinks about it. Who do you think gave them the White Ensign? So anyway, in the race between streamers, someone's going to pick up home blur. We can always hope. From your mouth to God's ears. Not a research role, but I recall a job posting for an IT role that required like uh, 10 years of experience in a program language that only existed for three or four. That's not unusual. That's right. I just watched Design, Design, Design from two years ago. Oh, good lord. There are so many videos which I think I ought to go back and redo because I, I think I'm better at doing them now. I hope I'm better at doing them now. Yeah, I worry whenever people start saying a that history isn't useful, or b that it should, you know it's you know it, uh, the skills aren't useful for historians when historians are basically the group who are best trained as a rule at, and are basically trained from the entire way at figuring at um, fishing out people who are biased and lying in sources because that's pretty much our entire career is based on sniffing at them and going, are we quite sure? But life happens. Life happens. So why have I now gone on to this one? Well, because the same French Admiral who earlier ago got driven off because he fought he fought he was engaging a naval squadron rather than a merchant fleet, got into more trouble on the Mar in March 1806, on the 13th of March 1806. Not a good day for everyone. This was against a very nice general, uh, a gentleman, called uh, Admiral Sir John Bolles Warren, who is a Royal Navy officer who does all sorts of things. He's actually a very good naval officer. The Royal Navy is quite lucky to have him. He's a rear admiral in 1806. He would end up retiring from the Royal Navy in... I think it's in... 1807? 1808? Um, but he managed to serve in several successful roles. 
And he's also another admiral who's met officer who's married in a place called St. Mary's. Kind of interesting, a lot of Royal Navy officers seem to end up buried in, play in churches which are called St. Mary's. Ogle, we talked about earlier, St. Mary's Church, Twickenham, St. Mary's in Twickenham, where actually I did my bachelor's. And St. Mary, uh, this one, uh, this officer, Warren, is buried in St. Mary's Church, Attenborough, in North uh, Nottinghamshire, which is a quite a nice place to go. Anyway, in 1806, Lunar is still is feeling rather bad, and he has a squadron of one ship of the line and one frigate. Warren has seven for a seven ships of the line. Warren knows exactly what he's facing. Lenar has failed to capture or even engage large British merchant convoys on his cruise because he's been driven off now mm, two to three times, depending on how you uh, do the sums. So, what does Warren do? Well, traditionally, what are warships? They sail in close order. Nice form. They look like a naval squadron. So, at 0300 hours on the 30th of March, Lenoir, what does Lenoir see? Scattered sails. They're, oh, they're all hickledy pickledy. They're in a sort of, they're very loose line of convoy. They look, they look like merchant ship. They're being poorly handled. They're all going so slow we can bear. They must be East Indiamen. So he decides to investigate them. Warren late waits till he gets really close. And I mean really close. It was 0530 hours. Well after Lenoir had uh, overruled uh, the captain Alain and Laird Marie, uh, Marie Brulac of the Belle Poule, that they were British warships. And it was at 0530 hours that London, HMS London, appears from the gloom ahead of Marengo. And, well, Lenoir at this point uh, realises his mistake. Because London is a 90-gun, second-rate ship of the line going, Hello, you're a 74! <sighs> It's always nice to know you have you have this sort of experience. Uh, and basically the French ship tries to fight. It tries to fight and goes, well, you know, I can win this. 98 guns versus 74, you know, I, I can hold this off. But by 6 a.m., which is 40 minutes later, he realizes that much and swung away, trying to get away. The frigate, the Bell Pool, tries to continue to engage London to uh, give Lunar support as he attempts to pull away. However, at 0615, as Relax sighted Amazon. Now, Amazon is a 38 gun fifth race line frigate under a guy called William Parker. Yes, that is the future Admiral of the Fleet, Sir William Parker, who was a captain's servant in the Battle of the Glorious First of June and had been acquitting himself well ever since. By 0830 hours, Parker had managed to pull us alongside Brilliac, and they exchanged fire the next two hours, and Amazon succeeded in damaging Bellpool's rigging to prevent her escape, 
and Marengo continued to be battered by London. At 10.25, Fordaunt, Fordaunt, uh, Fordaunt which was a 80-gun, third-rate ship of the line of the Royal Navies, uh, turns up and has also Repulse with her, which is a 74-gun third-rate, and Ramillies, another 74-gun third-rate, and they all take part in the battle, and Marengo is going, this is not fair. At 1100 hours, they lower the ensign. They lower the three color and surrender. Brulac surrenders to Belle Pool pretty much simultaneously for similar reasons because the damage inflicted by the Amazon is just too great, but also Warren's squadron, this mass of third rates, second rates, sitting in front of them going, how do we fight this lot? French losses in engagement were 63 men killed and 83 wounded in the Marengo. Uh, the wounded included both Linois and his son, and Captain Vigrant, who lost his right arm. The Bell Pool included six killed and 24 wounded from her complement of 330. London suffered 10 dead and 22 wounded. Amazon, four killed and five wounded. And uh, London was the only ship really damaged with her rigging. What can I say? So the ruse had worked twice one way as merchant ships pretending to be warships. And, well, the last time it works the other way, warships pretending to be merchant ships. I think there must be, uh, don't take us wrong way, I'm just noticing I'm getting lots of messages about Mysteries of the Deep tonight, so I'm presuming someone's watching Mysteries of the Deep somewhere, which is of course the program I'm on, on I think it, is it, is it Discovery? I forget which program, I think it's Discovery UK it's on. But no, it's fun, it's a good program. Maybe. Uh, mayhaps listen to your freaking captains. Yeah, maybe. <clears throat> nice thing. Will Sarango Street be a prayer ring? Um, probably not, because the I, I've tried to concentrate on things which are less common examples. Sarango Street comes up quite a lot as an example. Gogolander. How important is the impact of 10 more guns per side? Not as important as the fact that your guns, you, you might be carrying heavier guns. Where was the French fleet based from, Mauritius? It was running around the world doing that, to an extent. It was trying to operate from Mauritius and various other ports, but it was so theoretically their Indian Ocean squadron. Not a wolf. Wait, it sounded like Amazon gives a pounding to the friendship, but there were so few casualties. I'm assuming, no, it gave a complete nut of pounding, but it took out its rigging. 
British ships tended to concentrate on taking out the French ship's rigging so they couldn't go anywhere. It all depends when you're firing, whether you're firing on the up roll or the down roll. If you're firing into the hull or you're firing up. If you're firing into the hull and it's well built hull, it can take a pounding, but the splinters will come out. And they can do... There's also the level of what's wounded and what's not wounded. Uh, there's wounded to the extent that you're bleeding and damaged. There's wounding to the extent you're just bleeding because of splinters. Gagalander, it's, it's cumulative in terms of the fire rate. So let's say if I have 98 guns, you have 74. So I have 49 on each side. You have 37. So I have 12 more guns than you. Now, if we f have a fire, if we fire each other and I knock, and some of my guns are heavier than yours. Let's go with that one. But let's just talk about the number of guns you pierced for. So I have advantage of probably elevation if I'm a second rate. I'm, I'm going to have a third deck, so I'm going to be firing down on you as well as up at you. And that's going to mean I can clear the deck quite a lot, quite quickly. So your crew is going to be sheltering down inside the main hull, inside the, the main wooden, uh, wooden, because, uh, wooden decks, because honestly, I've got probably various forms of shrapnel weapon system which are going to clear the top deck. Now, I keep pounding you. Maybe you lose a couple of guns. Maybe I lose a couple of guns. But remember, you lose a couple of guns, you're starting off with a lot less than me. So that's going to be cumulative. And the more you lose guns, the more, uh, the more likely you are to lose guns, and less likely I'm to lose guns. Now, Asai, Asai of the Wooden Guns. Now, during the Second Sino-Japanese War, the Japanese needed to transport troops to China rather quickly. But they also needed to secure them when they transported them there. They needed them to arrive safely. They didn't have enough warships. So, a lot of their older ships were activated for this. Now, Asai took troops and was actually a troop-carrying ship. But they fitted wooden guns to her in order so she could look like she was still a warship when she went into harbour with those troops ashore. So it's not just the troops landing, but they brought a battleship with them. Yes, as I got sunk by the USS Salmon. So Mission Deep is doing a lot of season series one reruns. I'm hoping that means a new series new episode is not far off. I'm hoping so too, because right? I seem to remember taking part in recording of season two. I know I got paid for it. I like doing TV work. I have this wonderful guy. I'm just going to say this now. If anyone's watching this, who is any historian who's getting involved, or anyone who wants to get involved in TV work, get an agent. I'm with a particularly nice one called Nigel from Past Preservers. Doesn't only look after me, looks after many of my friends who I've recommended uh, recommended him, them, him to. And he's one of the nicest people you ever meet. But by golly, do you do the firms pay? He's very effective. It's a case of, it's a very easy, simple. If someone calls up going, I want to pay you in exposure, which doesn't pay the bills, or any of the other options, I go, well, in no, a no, no, nice way, we can talk after you sort out fees, but I everything with Nigel, because I've got a contract with him, so everything has to be sorted out with him. It's always a good test. One, if they're a legitimate company, they will go to the agent. If not, they won't. Two... The moment they go to him, it's basically a case of, you will sign a contract before he will open his mouth. Very nicely done, does it very politely. Yeah. 
Wish I had him. I wish he would take on the job of dealing with universities. Deku, how big was a penny at that time? 30 to 31 millimeters? Probably. I'm doing my math. Mm. Mm. That may be 20 millimeters? Mm. Think about 20 millimeters. Hi, Jack Ray. Gogolan, good. Uh, got it. It's not about the 10 guns per se, uh, per se but it's about many other applications to be a second or third rate. Yeah. Basically, you don't want to be in a fight versus a second rate if you're a third rate. And you really don't want to be in a fight versus a first rate. But mainly, you have the second rates as a sort of occasionally you build them to maybe match up if you have first rates and problems. That's right. Why were some pre dreadnoughts converted to repair depots, stores, ammunition, ship, cargo, test bed, command ship, mining ship, the upper ship, mining ship, tenor? Because they're very good hulls. They're nice, good, stable hulls, and triple expansion engines are relatively economical to run. So they might as well have it. Um, I'm not. I don't think this. I think on the screen it's the other way around, but it comes through. But uh, if I do this, this side is my port, and this side is my starboard. Left or right? So, do you know where to watch uh, Mysteries of the Deep in the Journey Illegally? Amazon. Amazon Prime has Mysteries of the Deep. That's quite good. I enjoyed them, and I the people behind them are lovely who are look after Mystery of the Deep. Right. As I'm trying to not just do all the traditional things. Now, why am I bringing up Operation Chariot? Well, on the way in, the British do everything they can to try and pretend... They are not who they are. They have not just Boeing message, uh, bombers going in, but their MGB-314 replies in a coded message, which had been obtained from a German trawler during the Vagasi, uh, the Vagasi raid, also known as Operation Archery, in Norway in December 1941. And when they had a shore battery open fire on them, both Campbellton and MGB 314 replied with being a ship being fired upon by friendly forces. Uh, this confused the Germans. And this is what basically allows them to get within one mile of the dock gates. And it's only at this point that BT orders the German flag lowered. This is BT spelt B A B E A T T I E. Not B A E A T T Y. And the white ends in raid raised. At this point the German fire increases because they're sure of what they're engaging. They also, at this point, is when they really engage the guard ship and sink her.
Sorry, second, I have a fluffy research assistant who would like to go out and use the facilities, and he's asking very nicely. I'll be back in a second. Do I have to come watch you, or can you do this yourself? If you're going to behave nuts, I'll have to come watch you. Just check you've got no slugs in your paws paw again. Not fun when you bring slugs in on my carpet. It's a nice clean carpet. Sorry about that. Poodles are poodles. Sending the obsolete American destroyer into the dock stuff for the toys. It works. And it wouldn't have worked if they... They did look at trying to do it the heavy way, and they just thought that would lose them a lot of ships. So they did it instead the smart way. The minimal risk way. The daring way. And uh, by the time the Germans notice it, give them time for the battle engine. Yeah. And so, didn't they have a recognition flare? It was for the type for aircraft, not vessels. Yes, they did have a flare as well they put up, but that was an aircraft flare, I think, as well. How did that photo survive? Well, you see, what happens is the destroyer hits the harbour, hits the gate, and it's on a timed explosive. And it takes too long for the explosion. Basically, the crew will abandon ship as quickly as they can to get away before the explosion goes off. And then, in the next day, the Germans are wandering around it, taking photos and going, Ah, isn't this brilliant? This is brilliant. Brilliant. You know, well, this has just failed. It's failed. And then it goes, boom. And then they have a problem. And a lot of people are aboard when it goes, boom. Hmm. At the beginnings of the German manned space program, Beatway, didn't they try a similar thing on the French, or was it the Spanish, and blow up uh, fortifications with ships full of gunpowder a few centuries prior? Um, I think various people, but basically, I would argue that the St. Nazaire raid and the use of Campbelltown is basically a continuation of the fire ship. Pro uh, uh, fire ship operations. Basically, the idea is we send a ship that's a bomb into an enemy fleet or force. So, they did it in a daring way, but wouldn't waste the daring on that up. Um, yeah, pretty much. Campbelltown is the perfect ship to use on that up. Also, it looks close enough to 
some of the, especially some of the captured German ships that it could get through it. Interesting. The explosives were well stowed and sealed in. They would not have opened a door. Uh, they couldn't. Would not have opened a door and got a compartment full of TNT. Yeah, it was really done properly to, in order to make sure the explosives got there as well. Um, let's see. 40 senior German officers and civilians were on tour of Campbell and were killed. Um, in total, the explosion took out about 360 men. According to Robert Montgomery, the Royal Engineers, who was attached to number two cam uh, commando, Campbelltown was meant to detonate at 0430 hours. The delay caused, he believes, by some of the acid in the pencil detonators being distilled away. As the morning progressed, more and more captured co uh, comrades joined him in the G German HQ. Just before the camp tunnel exploded, Sam Beatty was being interrogated by a German officer who was saying that it wouldn't take very long to repair the damage the camp tunnel at Campbelltown had caused. Just at that moment, she went up. Beatty smiled at and said, Well, not quite as foolish as you think. Um, day after the explosion, the organization Tot workers were assigned to clean up the debris and wreckage. On the 30th of March, at 4.30 hours, uh, that's in the afternoon. The torpedoes from MTB-74, which had also been on the delayed fuse setting, exploded the old entrance into the basin. This raised alarm amongst the Germans, unsurprisingly. Uh, the top workers ran away. The guards, mistaking their khaki uniforms for British uniforms, opened fire, killing some of them. And the Germans also decided to do a street-by-street -street search, thinking more commandos were still hiding in the town, and this also resulted in death for some more townspeople. It took the dock out of service for the remainder of the war. And that's the important thing. If you think about the impact of the Germans being able to base their submarines from French ports and French Atlantic ports, Imagine if they'd been able to base their large surface ships from French ports. Imagine if they'd been able to do that. The impact and effect on the Royal Navy and on its knee, its operational capacity would have been massive. It has enough issue affect it, protecting the Arctic convoys and watching northern routes. If the Germans have been able to maintain a force based in the Atlantic side of France to affect operations in the Bay of Biscay, but also the mid-Atlantic, that would have been a tremendously dangerous scenario for the British to deal with. It would have certainly put a far greater strain on the war effort. It might have meant that there were no ships able to be deployed to the Far East and no ships available to really support some of the convoys in the Mediterranean. You needed capital ships for that. And before people go, well, the British have so many capital ships compared to the Fra uh, Germans and Italians. Yes. But the thing is, the Germans and Italians get to pick out when they come out. The British are having to escort convoys all the time. They're having to escort fleet operations all the time. So that means for every one German ship you have deployed somewhere, the British probably need three or four capital ships in that area to guarantee they have available availability of a capital ship to engage it. And you can turn around and go, yes, but aircraft carriers can sink capital ships and other ships with torpedoes can. Yes, they can. But again, you need them in their places. And yes, that's not 100% reliable. It's not 100. If you look at the sheer number which are used to sink Yamato and other ships by the end of the war, that's lovely to have and is a viable thing by the end of the war. But in 1940s, the early 1940s, late 1930s, it's a possibility. It's not a certainty. The only certainty you have in engaging something which is a big hulking piece of metal 
floating around is your other big hulking piece of metal with guns on top floating around. And you've already, in the British case, had a stark, a stark lesson that using a cap, all not all capital ships are the same. That whilst the treaties might have treated them as of the similarity, battle cruisers are still battle cruisers, and battleships are battleships. And whilst fast battleships are on the line between the two, they're far closer to a battle ship than a battle cruiser. <sighs> And they're going to take a pounding and deliver a pounding. And there's a lot more areas on a battle cruiser you can get unlucky with. Did it? Clung Arrow, was this not the raid that resulted in Hitler's command order? I don't think, I think that was later in the war. It would have been interesting for them to find a bomb that basically the whole detonations and the, uh, the systems in the Camel Town have been built in. It had taken time in a dockyard. Now, yes, theoretically, if they got in to manage to get to the right place inside the hull and find it and managed to cut their way through, because they would have had to literally cut their way through, they could have done something. And you'd think in that dockyard they probably had the experience and skills around to do so. But they didn't. Because... And this is the point. At no point that the Germans turn around and think, hang on, maybe our enemy is not as not dumb. Instead, they're all congratulating themselves on how dumb the British were and how their plan to ram the dock had failed. There might well have been a few officers going around going, shouldn't we check it for a bomb? Shouldn't we? But the vast majority of senior officers were wandering around and going, Aren't we glorious and fantastic? We have won this mighty battle. <laughs> when was the uh, dried up put back into service? It didn't really get back into service during World War II. It was after the war that was probably fixed up. Thank you, uh, GW. Uh, hello, GW picked. I think most people. I'm going to just say this. And try, I've been ignoring things for a second. Uh, as a rule, we do keep to nail history, not politics. I watch the politics, and if it's getting too out of hand, I will hunt it down. But I also realise that people who are engaged in history and enjoy history tend to be quite engaged with current affairs, and sometimes these things spill out. So, a watch. Uh, first, the Germans likely assumed the plan was to ram and destroy the Cassians, so we'll not necessarily have looked for an explosive fuse. Yes and no. Uh, whilst I agree you could make that assumption, uh, that's also assuming uh, that's an, a big assumption. It's the, the whole thing is that usually you have to... How do I put this? It's okay to make an assumption, but first of all, verify it. And there's that old saying, trust but verify. I, you might assume they're destroying the castle team, just, on the ca uh, just in case they're not, it might have been good to go hunting. Because even if there's a 10% chance you're wrong, uh, you, a 10% chance, only a 10% chance in your mind that you are wrong and they weren't going for the Cassian, it still would have been better, to, considering the amount of effort the British have been do doing it, in, relying on them just go, having gone for the Cassian seems to be uh, uh, an assumption too far for me. Uh, 
in turn, then they would have to find the fuses, starting with the anti-tamper fuse and evade the booby, tra booby trap fuses, which are in place such that removing some bolt of the damn things would make you laugh. Yeah, it's fun. Uh, yeah, no. What about Brest? Too close to the UK? Uh, not in, not a big enough dry dock facility for it. And... Tanavelica, Dr. Vark, if St. Nazaire hadn't been attacked, wouldn't the RAF have done something to terminate it? RAF had been trying to terminate it. Trust me, the RAF bombing it was the first choice and first plan. They also looked at the idea of actually bombarding it from offshore with battleship guns. It, this is not the first choice. This is the, we've gone down a list of options. This is the best one we think that actually will work. And Sherman, aircraft carriers have rather less biting in stormy weather. Hard to mount an airstrike if planes can't take off. Very true. Didn't function again until 1948. It was not recommissioned until 1950, the dry dock. So they don't seem to have actually, from the stuff I've read about it, and my own view is you wouldn't allow such senior officers to be touring the ship if you conceived the idea it was a bomb. And even if you say you did conceive it was a bomb and you let it presumed it had it, uh, its fuse and malfunction, so it hadn't gone off, and therefore it was safe for the bombers, to, uh, the senior command officers to go short, go aboard it. No, at no point. If you consider good bomb disposal technique, you never assume a bomb is not. You always assume the bomb is live. You never assume it that it's safe until you have made it safe. And I'll assure it's safe. So, yeah, the entire thing is very silly. They would have needed foreknowledge of the precise location and town devices, none of which they had. Mm, a good bomb disposal crew and a good shipwright could probably have figured out those things. Whether they'd have been able to figure it out in time is a different matter. But even at that point, there's the whole allowing people on the ship. And there are other things you could have done to try and get the ship away from the dock in that time. Don't worry, G2 Epic. As I said, I, I, I let it get certain far as you as on past lives. If it goes too far, I step in and shut it up. But usually I can rely on the admins being fairly fair and letting things shut them up uh, and letting things stop quite quickly. Stafford does a good job. Even though I know he is very passionate about his politics. Excuse me. Hmm, what's this concrete monolith at the base of the gun forward gun mount? Oh, I'm sure it's nothing. Don't worry about it. They failed. Yeah, that's some of the issues. Then, Pops, if you know it's a bomb, you see men running away. If you don't know that, you see troops landing. Agreed. Although, mm, the number of troops landing is not that many. How easily would it have been repaired if the base had been cracked by earthquake bombs? I, I realised the raid was before they existed. Slightly more difficult to repair, but again, as before the, those bombs existed, that's the trouble. It's what technology do you have at the time when you're launching the raid. And you need to hit it with a lot of earthquake bombs to guarantee you had done that. And cracking the base is almost not as effective as actually smashing one of the ends. And specifically that end to deal with access.
Necro before Sunday. Would doing a Camel Town be a viable way to deliver a nuclear weapon? I prefer not to. Um, if they'd managed to tow Campbellton out, which is difficult, but if they'd done it, I suppose if they tried to do it immediately under the dark, uh, you know, immediately, they might have had a chance to get it off in time, um, which is sort of one of the options might have done, possibly, Le a lot less damage. It's nowhere near on the size of a Halifax explosion. Yeah, I have to say I get tired of the politics as well. We're having fun in the UK at the moment. Then it wasn't the demolition of the dried up pumping gear just as important as Cassian. It was, and that was done by the commandos. Which is another reason why the Germans probably possibly thought it was all just, you know, round the Cassian and uh, damage the dry dock pumping gear. Yes, we do seem to have a good group, it seems, on in the chat on the channel, who do understand that people have different views of politics and sometimes they have different experiences which lead to those views. Anyway, German surface raiders. So they are a big part of World War II. The German surface raiders and some of the tactics which are going to taking them down. Now, if we consider the Deutschland class, well the most famous of those is the Grass Bay. Hello. The Grass Bay likes to change her appearance, pretend to be an American cruiser. Or anything else she can fake herself out of this. And of course, when she herself is attacked by the British, the way the British are handling themselves, Langsdorf is convinced, convinced that he is facing two destroyers and a light cruiser. He's convinced he's facing two destroyers and light, light cruisers. Specifically, he thinks he's facing an Arafusa class and two tribals. When actually he's facing Exeter and two Leanders. Which is a very different scenario, isn't it? It is a very different scenario. I know, I know. You're you, you're entirely up here to keep you keep yourself in biscuits. That's entirely why you want to be in my lap. Looking adoring. Hello. Yes. Hello. The Germans also, though, didn't stop with just having the Deutschland class. In many ways, the Deutschland class are a bit of a bruise de guerre themselves because they look like the surface raiders, the way they are diesel powered long range. Everyone's focusing on those. And so, to an extent, they miss the Hilskluser, the auxiliary cruisers. This is, of course, Atlantis, Cormoran, and Comet for. Um, Hansa, Mekel, Ryan, Penguin, Stia, and Vera. These ships are interesting vessels. They are the critical component in many ways for the Germans in doing all they're doing in terms of threatening global trade because submarines don't have the range, especially not in 1939-1940. These ships do. These ships have the range to threaten British global tra uh, British trade everywhere in the world, and that's important. You know, you have the option of attacking an opponent from one direction or every direction. If you're attacking an opponent from every direction, they have to split their forces everywhere. Um, as mentioned earlier, you have the British have to be strong everywhere. They have to be able to defend their trade everywhere in the world, and that means that requires them four or five ships in that region. And you might not eat your cruiser, your health cruiser might not even be in that area. It might be somewhere else completely. But the British can't afford not to be protective in that area because they don't know where your health cruiser is. They only know where it is from where it's been. So it's the same problem when they're tracking the graph space. They know where it's been, not where it's going to be. The whole battle of a plate happens, hello, because basically. The Royal Navy take a punt. Commodore Harwood 
is experienced in the South America in the South America station, understands the South Atlantic, and goes either the grass bay will make for home. Either it'll make for home, it'll try and run home for safety, in which case it's going to run into the home fleet and more likely into Force K on the way, because Force K is sitting in the middle Atlantic going, come to me, my pretty. We have Ark Royal and we have Renown. Come to us, come to us. Or it's going to go try and make some great wins. And again, where is it going to go for the great wins? Well, the greatest place to go, the really fat, rich, soft underbelly of the South Atlantic is the River Plate. So that's why he gathers his force there. And again, that's a good example of you fight battles with what you have, not what you'd like to have, because uh, theoretically on his force, he has Cumberland, Exeter, Ajax and Achilles. But Cumberland is down in the Falkland Islands doing some self-maintenance, so she's not available. And that's his most powerful cruiser. That's the one which, if he'd had, would have made a real impression on Graf's Bay, because that would have been eight extra eight-inch guns, and that would have been, of course, the ship which had been done when she'd out, been out solo, Graf's Bay, when she'd spotted her, had done her best to avoid her, because they didn't want to take on a heavy cruiser. Because they weren't sure of victory, or rather, they weren't sure of getting victory without getting taking sufficient damage, they would actually get sunk by something else. And this is the point for a surface raider. They have no place to go to get repairs. Also, please note on this route, uh, this group, Altmark and other supply ships are not included in the Hills Cruiser numbers. But they're just as important. They're part of the Hills Cruiser support force. They're part of the submarine support force. No, you're not chasing her. She's allowed to wander around the garden just as much as you are. Besides, last time you chased her, I opened that door and she was away before you even had a chance to even look at her. It depressed you for three days. Sorry, talking to the big fl uh, to the uh, fluffy research assistant about the fox, or as I call her, the red uh, the redhead fluffy research assistant, or the foxy fluffy research assistant, depending on what mood I'm in. Congress, having a nice slab of concrete bar, can we mistake it for an impromptu ramming apparatus? Potentially, but also potentially... I, 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 I'm sorry if I, I would start thinking why. Tried aircraft maintenance technician for college, but too stressful and locked down. I'm a general in labor and I'm an amateur naval designer. Mm. To be fair, please note that having met Stafford and chatted with him, and that this was the entire group's view of Stafford from the uh, from our group in Canada when we went to Canada, we decided that he had the brains and the skills to be a uh, to be a look after aircraft maintenance, definitely. But we decided that probably it was the exams which caused him issues from our discussions. Because he's really smart. In the UK, would probably be put, would probably go through the apprentice route, which I'm not sure if they have in Canada the same sort of style of a exam, a sort of semi exam free route, which is viable in the apprentice system. Roman Cash, the only problem with politics is sadly it seems to be a present state of the things is when uh, when it's purely binary politics. There's always an issue that. And when people start to believe their their politic their political teams are like their political parties are like their football teams, and therefore are tribes worthy of un, uh, unswerving, unquestioning support, which I disagree with in football and rugby as well. But let me put it this way: in football or rugby, doesn't tend to cause the trouble it does in politics. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Kind of honorable mention of the World War One Hilfskruger Siedler, a ship of steel and sail. Yes, Hil they, these ships are many in many ways based on German World War One experience. They tied up a lot of British forces, and that's what the Germans were trying to do: tie up a lot of British forces around the world, and cause damage, and cause things like uh, things like insurance rates, etc., to increase. Didn't the K class subs have a lower 12,000 order mile range? That's not too much less than Spade. Does that make that much difference? Um, let's put it this way the K class subs are a bit of a rare, a rare thing. They are a rare thing. Rather than cash, please, no one, no one. None of my little cousins, please Google that. Do not Google that subject as suggested by Greg Salsky. <sighs> yeah, uh, specifically at this naval review. You'll see from this picture there is Hood and I think Renown in the background from memory. <laughs> it's going around. So as you said earlier, there are parallels with the power of logistics and repair situation is going quite strong. Exactly. And cash. The academia is great, but knowledge is not just a campus thing. If you have a passion to learn about something, now more than ever, just do it. Yes, this is my point I often make. Uh, there is learning available in all sorts and all sorts of forms these days. And it's learning what is good learning is part of that. Learning in education, learning to when you know and need to, uh, how much you need to know, what you need to know. know. Thank you, old Richard. Uh, the apprenticeship is a good one. It, right? In the UK, we have. Um, I enjoy teaching the apprentices because they, there are some apprentices and uh, apprentice schemes which also run for universities. And we have some who come into King's University, and I still teach them history of engineering. They get to do the same course as I, get. I, I teach the other students as well. And the apprentices really love the history of engineering stuff because it's a case of there won't be an exam at the end. There is coursework. You get to pick your. T you get to pick any two, three engineers, or people from your field, whose story inspires you, and write about them, and compare and contrast them, and say what lessons you can learn from them, and the amount of them who just go. That sounds cool. The only person I've now banned, yeah, the only two people I've now banned are Elon Musk and Tesla, because the amount of people who were just doing Elon Musk and Tesla as a combination, I just got, I just banned it in the end. It just was, because I like both of them, but the whole point of the essay was that they weren't supposed to be doing something which I would have to turn into a comparative marking assignment, because mm, it's supposed to be a pass or fail course, a, a pass or fail course. And the moment you have comparative marking on, then people start to, uh, you you can't adjust things as much for passing or failing because it's let's be honest, history of engineering is more about teaching academic skills and the skills needed for research than it is necessarily knowledge, although knowledge is pretty useful. Andy, I think the concept of Deutschlands was wrong and they were dead end design. The hippoclass would have been far more effective. You're preaching to the choir.
Interesting. The German side generally seems to have favoured larger guns. It seems like the rate of um, fire, not size of shells, has the greater influence on Nelvic battles. Rate of fire often has more of an influence on battles than we'd like to think. Up and down. This is the point that you have to get into. It's amount of explosive that actually hits the enemy. And your choice of uh, increasing that is rate of fire or size of shell. And this is why the Royal Navy picks the 6-inch over the 8-inch gun for most uh, late, sort of up to World War II builds in the sort of the late 19, uh, mid to late 1930s. Because the triple 6-inch turret will deliver a far greater rate of fire and a far greater amount of explosive on target than the 8-inch turret will. Uh, the shear ends up... Mm, what does happen to the shear? The Deutschen becomes the Lutzer, and the Shear, remember correctly, oh. which one of them ends up, it's, she's buried, isn't she? She's buried in Kiel. She was bombed in Kiel and buried, and moved to Kiel and for uh, repairs in 1945, uh, uh, and then... Bombed there, and Parsh, uh, she's now buried underneath in, in Kiel somewhere. She was basically taken out by the RAF and various other things after operations in the Baltic. But she was trying to remove people. The whole class, none of them have good ends. None of them have good ends. Wandering Chandler, what does iron brew taste like, really? I cannot really describe it. It's a taste of what it's own. There is n I have drunk many drinks in my life. There have been none which are like iron brew. I thought you said engineer. I didn't think Musk was an engineer. Yeah. You see, the trouble is once you start including people in the engineers who are sort of inventors and other things like that, Musk sort of crosses the line. And he's fine. But just no. Comparative essay, email, a comparative, comparative uh, essay is just on Tesla and Musk is just, yeah. Oh, Richard, time was in the USA. He recently graduated engineer, started off the drafting room of faculty floor. Actually, thought not some sense in military. I was remember my dad. He went to um, Cambridge University first. Started off his naval architecture there, and then went and became an apprentice at Camel Lairds. And you sit there and go, so yeah, you came from Cambridge Union. Where do you start off? Uh, I, I started off with um, doing carpentry. Then I went to welding. Then. My dad pretty much was trained in everything in the yard and then slowly gets up to draftsman. You think you've done his time at Cambridge and then he moves up there and works up from there. And you realize once you've completed the um, apprenticeship at Camel Eds, as well as the degree, you are really are a naval architect. You really are a chartered naval architect. And that's the How much did losing Hood affect the Iron's ability to counter the German subsidies? Would the battle cruisers have been more successful with Hood given the state she's in? Um, there's honestly, uh, basically, having Hood around was useful. She was capable of high speed, but she also hadn't been refitted and repaired. So. Yeah, there is a lot of there is a big problem. I would. There are many governments in the run up to World War Two who I would like to take to one side and go. You need to give more budget to this. 
But you have to remember, they all felt that they could solve things with diplomacy. They felt that politicians could solve it with politicians, they wouldn't need military force. And so they don't fund things. If you... If you'd had a faster rate of refit and repair, if you uh, refit, especially in the 1930s, and you've been refitting more capital ships and whilst building new ones, and you refitted all the battle cruisers prior to World War II, you'd have had a very different scenario than you faced. Basically, again, it's that, that old thing. For the RN to have those available, they need a lot more. Because they need to be able to main, match the German force at any time. They can't afford to just have the same number of ships as the Germans. They need to be able to match the German force. And they need to be able to match the German force in more places. Because which way does the German force go? The ocean is a very big place. What's their route going to be? You know, This is one of the examples when we're talking about the various patrols the British do to try and intercept German surface raiders going into the North Atlantic, where they have to set up those patrols, where they have to set up their presence to cover the entire Greenland, Iceland, UK, Faroes gap. Guys, the only two just to go for the Chief are the National Prestige and the Triple 11 inch Targe, which came very handy for the Shanhorse and Nighthouse. Still, uh, Dr. Clark pointed out that an all forward arrangement would have made them way better or rather less worse. Yes, there are advantages to going an all forward arrangement. Why do we forget that the Francisco Caracola, Leon, and Normandy super dreadnoughts would have been modified as a result of Alder Jordan? Mainly because they didn't, the, those governments didn't make a much fuss of not of of um, of modifying it as the British made of modifying the Admiral class. That's the problem with commerce raiding Model Two. You could be as fast as you want, but if the Gum ships are slower than the battle cruisers escorting them. Your speed is useless. Pretty much. That's one of the reasons why, again, you can use an R-Class for a convoy escort, because it doesn't need to leave the convoy. It just needs to beat out the convoy. And your battle cru your Shan Horse and Eisenhower, do you really want to fight an R-Class? You might win, but it's got 15-inch guns, and it will cause you a lot of damage. And if you get damaged, you're not getting home because there are going to be other battleships coming out to you. And this is the thing. Every surface raider pretty much has a glass jaw because of that. Because the moment they get damaged, their chances of getting home go well down. Very far down. I think we're right. Uh, There are many things about Musk. Wondering, uh, uh, Chandler, I heard the sugar tax did quite a number of takes. Is that true? Nope. For a short while, then they brought out 1901, and then they've reverted to the original, uh, to the, um, to, uh, to it. Because they found it wasn't that good. BCH, to be honest, I found Iron Brew to be a quiet taste. I brought a case of the stuff with sugar, not the diet version, and I found it to be a bit pasty. Not my thing. <laughs> oh, no, I won't ban him for that. I will not ban him for that. Going land, Doc, and those politicians were shell shocked by World War I. Yes, that's the other problem. Mankuch, in real life, DK Brown quotes Goodall as saying that wasn't considered worthwhile refeeding a hood. Old ship, old armor scheme, minimal benefit from refit. Plan was replaced with a new build. Um, yeah, I have... Yeah. <laughs> this is going to sound terrible, but DK Brown's quote of Goodall in that account is... 
how do I put this? Goodall is the in charge of construction. He is the basically the chief naval architect for the Royal, uh, for the Royal Navy, working with Henderson, and they're constantly having to balance various criteria. So Goodall writes that saying, "If we can get a new build, that is better. If, however, we do not have funds to get a new build in time enough soon." I, the new build will come in time to replace renown, a repulse, but not uh, not renown and hood. Then we need to refit hood to make her viable to keep her viable in the short term. So, it's one of those things where D. K. Brown quotes Goodall quite correctly. Goodall does write that, but he doesn't quote the full quote because it's a full page long discussion of it. And he quotes a, a couple of sentences from it, which are quite correct, but doesn't. there is a caveat to it. So it's a case of, first choice, build new ship. Yay! Second choice, well, we're going to have to repair it, and here's the scheme for how we do that. And please note, my dad and... DK Brown knew each other and chatted away quite a lot, and they both went through similar training schools. So it, it's always kind of interesting. Whenever I, re I I have DK Brown's books with my dad's notes in them, which is always fun. Ah, <laughs> uh, you'd have been fine, uh, Stafford. And you know, couldn't Renan have done a better job in the hood, freeing her up for refit? Um, Renown was doing other things. This is the other thing. And th these things never take place in isolation. Yes, Bismarck is out. Yes, they need to hunt her down. But there's other ships going on. There's other operations going on. Escort, a surface raider needs to tint wind without taking damage beyond anything superficial. An escort, if it protects convoy and limps back to port of holes, that did its job. Yep. Alright, Cash, is there a cost of ship versus a cost of any shipping sunk to ratio to make a surface raider worthwhile? And if it's not, why not? Because it's not just about ships sunk. Think of how many ships don't sail because there's a surface raider up. Think of how many convoys are rerouted and how much longer that, how much impacts that has on, on, on operations. Think of how many warships are not available for other operations because they're escorting convoys. Think of how many battleships, how many, how much crew, how much fuel, how much ammunition, how much resources are kept keeping those ships at sea, doing that convoy work to protect against surface raiders, even if they never actually engage surface raiders, because they might turn up. Surface raiders have a very big, a big area of effect, and it's far more than just the ships they sink. Well, he couldn't quote the entire thing. If DK Brown quoted the entire thing from Goodall, it would have been two pages, all of Goodall's quote. That wouldn't be exactly a good history work. It would be kind of boring to read as well. Mm, yes and no on the surface radar, but I'll leave it a becoming endangered species. I'll leave that to when the Kirov class part two comes out tomorrow. What would the French, Italians, Americans, Germans, and Japanese take away from Jutland? Mm, their own. Each one does their own war, battle study on it. The Americans do a lot of studies on Jutland. They refight it many times and think it through. For Ron and Cash, Fred or Service Raider has a value like fleeting being in it. Yes. So, H was her deal. Prior to the first battle assert, she was racing around pretending to be two battleships. Yes, she was racing around pretending to be two battleships. Caused them a lot of fun. Just sending a message quickly.
No, you're not getting another biscuit just because you're licking my chair. And please stop licking the chair. It makes the very slimy to actually for me to put my hand on and my arm on. It just... You put your arm on the armrest and your arm slides off because it's got so licked. Not fun for your papa. You're looking at me adoringly. Oh, yeah. Let's give you a licking. Now, she does this through using multiple radio signals, of course, but also from the fact that she can be as fast as she is. She races around and act, it looks like they're sort of going, well, these positions aren't, they, they, these positions could be two ships talking to each other. Gogolana, Ella, Ella, Ella the main with a late resupply would be a nightmare, not a glorious victory. Yes. And Daniel Poldick, sounds like a value of subterranean is largely in guards tied up to stopping them. Exactly. <laughs> yes, my fluff is very orientated. But this is important. If we think about the first battle of Cert and what happens during this battle. It comes very close. Very close to an Italian victory. It's five light cruisers and 14 destroyers on the British side versus four battleships, two heavy cruisers, three light cruisers and 13 destroyers on the other side. And, well, if it wasn't for Adil running around pretending to be battleships, the Italians would have done far more damage probably to the British force. You know, it was, the Italian Navy high, basically at one point, um, upright, uh, a group of Italian ships were uh, were attacked by HMS Upright, and then two ships would collide and, and had to return to base. Distant cover force was sighted by HMS Urge, and Vittorio Benito was torpedoed and forced to return to port. At which point, the you know the the Italians start to get worried about these, and then they get a report that a force of two battleships are at sea. And they order the ships to return to wait reinforcement. But the two battleships at sea are a decoy operation by HMS Adi, or basically running around going, we're signaling, we're a battleship force, we're a battleship division, yeah, yeah, we're going to be signaling. And the, it, it's basically entirely Abdiel. And at one point to do this, they have the captain and the XO are transmitting messages to each other with their own transmitting equipment. That's basically how they're running it as. As if they're two sides of the conversation. <laughs> oh. Well, look, I wasn't going to do just the Kirovs as in the big uh, the big cruisers. I had to do the other Kirovs because they're important. They're basically the bookends of Soviet cruiser construction. You have the Kirovs, which are their first, and the Kirovs, which are their last cruisers. Then we have D-Day, which of course has Taxable, Glimmer, and Big Drum, which are various operations carried out to literally fool the Germans into thinking that they're landing elsewhere. In fact, these are all various things from Operation Bodyguard, which is all done with the idea of making the Germans think that the D-Day landings are A, going to take place elsewhere, are actually taking place elsewhere, 
Uh, they've got stuff happening off the coast of Norway. They've got squadrons appearing off the Pas de Calais. Uh, they are doing everything they can to make the Germans confused about where D-Day is going to happen till D-Day happens. And even after D-Day happens, they keep it up to try and keep it confusing them. It's a good methodology. And I do love the fact that it's all undone in the brackets of something called Operation Bodyguard. <laughs> That's good. I can just imagine the CNXO sitting in the transmission room laughing at the deception. I'm sure they were having fun. Uh, CH, I, it actually reminds me of the shenanigans of Confederate General John McGruder, who had the same division marching in a circle to form McClellan, thinking he faced enormous force. It's not the first time. There is um, Schumach. Uh, to Schumach. To Schumach? Yeah, I think it was. Anyway, uh, one of the... Um, Leaders of native forces allied to the British in the, I think it is it the War of eighteen twelve. I'm not, I'm not sure. Uh, but anyway, he basically uh, the British commander real and him realize that the Americans are definitely afraid of their native allies, and they basically get Detroit, I think, to um, surrender because they just keep pass it, sending native troops around and around and around for a bit where they can only really see that and passing on this, but they can't see them circling around again and again. And they make sure to intersperse them irregularly with Canadian militia who are dressed as British regulars. Joanna, you would love to be here. They're transporting wind turbines, by, uh, by, uh, wind turbines by, uh, in front of my door. Cool. Oh my gosh, it must have been an easier job to convince the Germans that we were landing in the south of France as we actually were going to land in the south of France. Yeah, might as well. Don't know who makes up these operation names? God only knows. Taxable, Glimmer, and Big Drum. It's, you know, it's cute. And, oh, don't worry. No, no, no. no. It's not just the first US Army, the first US Army group. There's also the British Fourth Army, which is far less well known than the first US Army group. But the British Fourth Army is based up in Edinburgh, on Edinburgh Castle. And they're the entire part of base, a base of Fortitude North. The first US Army group are part of Fortitude South. And the idea is they make the Germans believe that the British are going to invade Norway. And that's what the Fourth Army group are for. I like the uh, one where they find a Monty actor and supply him with booze and have him show up all across the med. One of the wacky stories. It's not just Montgomery. Again, they have more than just one actor wandering around pretending to be people. We see it. The fact that the soldiers and commanders in the fort of Detroit were either completely drunk and or hung over helped with the deception. Surrender. They were drunk and hung uh, uh, drunk and hung over because they were so their morale had collapsed completely because they believed they had no support. Does help, but it kind of the British had kind of fed into that. Yeah, no, operation names. You drop a dictionary on the floor and pick a word from it. The page it opens on maybe. Um, to be fair, they're supposed to be random name generators, but it doesn't always work that way. But let's be honest, um, Dunkirk is Operation Dynamo, the rule from the rest of France is Operation Aerial. Um, while some names, uh, some operations do get very cool sounding names, there are other operations which get very weird sounding names. Uh, you know, uh, Operation Husky, let's be honest. Could have been Operation Poodle, but they went with Husky. And before anyone says it, I have done a Google search of that in the past, and I'm, I'm trying to remember what came up. And... 
The operation which came up, the only one I could find, was Operation Poodle Blanket, which was theoretically an American operation. And no, I have no idea why the Americans did an operation called Poodle Blanket, and I really don't know much more about it than that. He said, I spent several hours a week pretending to be a historian. What's it like to be a real one? Uh, expensive, but fun. That's good. Make sure to coordinate your deceptions. The US sound deception you made the Germans think attack was coming along the route with fake tank noises. CEO decided to attack there too. Hey! It's fine. Sometimes you attack by... Better. Sometimes you prove to help the deceptions by attacking where they think you're going to attack as well. Then they don't... Well, then they uh, believe the deception is all the more when you do them next time. Hmm. Now, Taryn, how big of a problem is it that the Italian Francisco Caracolo class and French Normandy class will be coming online at the same time as Hood was? Not really that much of a problem. More of a problem for them than Hood. Honestly, the poodle blanket sounds wonderful. Furious googling noises. <laughs> okay, man. Doc, talk to us about forthcoming about uh, the Italian uh, burning down Axis Force in North Africa. Yep. Take care, Glenn. Good luck. Andrew Peter, market was land operation and garden was the airborne op. Hmm. <laughs> I don't know. I do find all this stuff, especially the, you know, these operations. They involve movements and uh, movements and radio actions by usually small craft, like the most launch you see picture up there. Um, bombers like the Lancaster dropping various versions of chaff, basically tin foil in order to look like a lot of ships. So they provide a massive radar return signals and therefore there's a return of, there is a squadron of ships off this coast. There is a squadron of ships here. And that's how they were faking that there was uh, those whole flotillas and you know squadrons where they weren't. And one of the things was the British analyzed this quite clear clearly. They were watching for ultra reports about what was going on. And if it didn't work well, they refined it for the next one and made it better. And that's got yeah, that does happen, sadly enough. I think why would it be a problem for the Rachel Marine Marine National? It would only really be a problem for them from the perspective that they've just introduced new ships and they're already behind the times. That would be the problem for them. It's going on. Satellites and spy plane comms took, part, uh, took the fun part out of battles of the surprise. Not really. You can still pull off strategic surprise, maybe not, and sometimes tactical surprise. It, you know, there is a limitation to these things. Yes, in theory, these things provide you with information, but again, there are only a limited number of assets, and you can predict to an extent the movement of satellites and spy planes. You only have a limited number of them, where they're going to be, what they're going to be doing. Yeah. Hmm. 
Messina, the Pentagon claims that Poodle Blanket convinced you to for a possible confrontation over West Berlin uh, with the Soviet Union, no longer a country, still needed to be a secret for the fear of damage to current US national security. Yeah. That was fun. VCH, I recall the type of chaff being made that the wind dispersed looked like metal, a little metal maple tree seeds. Tiny helicopters so that the wind could tr keep them aloft longer. Yeah. Uh, hornbeam ones as well. They look, some of the British produce, some look like. Right. So, fake R class and Hermes. Again, this is the British. Why are they doing this? They're using Iron Duke, they're using merchant ships which are converted to look like fake battleships and fake Hermie, HMS Hermes. And they do it all because they need to try and convince the Germans they have far more shit, capital ships than they actually do. Because, again, they can't afford to have all the forces tied up where the Germans think they have them tied up because of that, those ships which potentially could come out. So this is the thing. How do you fake that you have more ships than you have ships available that you don't have? Well, you go for these. And the first thing I usually get asked by students is they go, well, why did they fake the R-Class? Why didn't they fake the Queen Elizabeth or uh, something else? Well, here's the thing. The British worked out that the Germans would be tracking the higher status units very carefully. But R-Class are high enough status they have to think about them, especially with convoy er, convoy protection, but aren't so high, st uh, high enough status that they're actually going to be tracking them as closely. So our class were the perfect things to get uh, to fake. And Hermes for similar reasons. No fake Ark Royal, fake Hermes. It did continue after Hermes sank because it still looked like an aircraft carrier. Anyway, I watched the film Longest Day a couple of years ago, and in the film they dropped dummy paratroopers to cause attraction. Yes, they do regularly. Paradummies. They, they use lots of them in D Day and all sorts of things. And Iron Duke was also used as a fake battleship. Even though by that point she really wasn't actually able to carry on doing it. And um, yeah. Old Centurion pretending to be a King George V at Alexandria. They, they do their best. They do their best. And today we of course still have the electronic cruisers. The US Navy does this especially. You've got the Zumwalts and the Growlers. And one of the things that, you know, this ship does is try and hide all its electronic missions so it can pretend to not be there. But it also can project electronic missions, so you might not think you're seeing a, a Burke. Uh, might not think you're seeing a Zumwalt. And I can't really get into more detail on that. I'm not really sure of much more detail than that. I only know that from some of the brochures and discussions of the systems which they've supposedly fitted it with. But it's also part of the thing with, the growl with, uh, with Growler, you know. The electronic warfare these days is not just about providing traditional jamming in terms of overwhelming a radar with contacts or providing with too much feedback. There is providing with feedback which looks like something that isn't something else. So you can look like a carrier battle group. You can look like a far larger force is over here rather than over there. So earlier some brought up the whole thing of satellites and spy planes. Well, yes. So we've got information gathering. So instead of converse, instead of you going for the whole now, instead of hiding by withholding information, you can often hide by providing too much information. The information loop has got to the point where the best form of manipulation is not denial of information; it's too overwhelmed with information to give the loop too much to process and hide in the obfuscation you create. It's fun times. And of course, this is a Q ship from World War One. It's a flower class, a flower class sloop, as it was at the time. Zumwalts have not been scrapped. The Zumwalts are getting their guns converted to um, hypersonic missile systems. So they're probably going to get them in service before the actual uh, Zircon armed Kirov comes into service. And reports. Kirov reporting, sir! 
Hmm. No. But I will take you in for your dinner shortly. I do realize you need, you want your food and you're going to complain at me shortly if I don't get you the, to your dinner. How many Q-ships sank? Hmm, can't remember off the top of my head. The thing about Q-ships, you have to remember, is they were... They're a part of a dirty tricks war in many ways, because most submarines engage their targets by coming onto the surface and engaging with guns, because torpedoes were expensive and they didn't carry that many, so their guns were far more useful. So they'd appear on the surface and they'd say, Surrender! Surrender! And the Q-ship would wait till they get close and open fire its own guns and sink them. And so the Germans started having to torpedo ships. And so this is actually one of the reasons why you end up with unrestricted submarine warfare, which of course leads the Americans to getting into the war. So you could say uh, the entire thing was the British being rather cruel and playing the long game. You could say that. But the British were losing, uh, losing ships a lot, and frankly, they didn't have many options. And then most Q-ships became conventional convoy escorts at that point. Hello. Too much information is a consistent we're going to have to see, we're going to see more and more of as time goes on. People rely on things like algorithms, etc., to try and sort information. And you can work out what the processing and limitations of those logarithms are quite quickly. But no, Ruse de Guerre is going to continue. It is 10 p.m. over here. And yes. Um, so, I should probably announce what's coming in the next live. Next live is Wayne Borian's Infrastructure in the Colonies. And I'm going to be starting off the August um, sort of choices sooner so that you can get it all done before I have to go away the first week of August. And then remember, there's going to be the specials coming out in the first week and the third week in August. Is there any hope for Polito Veliki? Well, that's all going to get discussed tomorrow in tomorrow's Long Patrol that comes out for that. The temp's fine at the moment. Not too hot today. It's been a bit of rain, but it's been fine. Yes, you're lovely, Annie. Yes, you are. You just want to be patted and fed. That's all you want in life, to be patted and to be fed. Am I writing? Am I am I patting the right spot in the back? In your back, yes, patting the right spot. Oh yeah, that's good. Oh, that's good, Papa. Is it? That's good. Right. Limitation computer pack is why my battle cruiser has liquid nitrogen tanks to keep the quantum uh, computer cool enough to function. Yep. Right. So, thank you very much, everyone. Hope you've enjoyed. Hope you found it useful and interesting. And yeah, thank you. As you can see, this is the office. And I will, before we go, before we go, give you all a quick tour. Because someone's asking for a 360. Not quite going to give a 360, but this is to say, that's what I'm still needing to paint up there. As you can see, all the books are down there. But yeah. And if I turn the light on, You'll see I have the paintings up there. That's my office. And that's the shelving space. And there are shelves going in there, down in there. Once I've got this all painted and prepped, the books will go back up. And then the shelves will be installed down there. And then the books will descend between there. And then the railway will hopefully be built there. And over here we have tower, which is not working, but does have its own custom modification of Vicky compartment working. Traditional printer. And yeah, everything's set up at the moment. Thank you, Jeffrey. And yeah, so yeah, hope you enjoyed it. And so this is the office. We're slowly working it through. This one is slightly less helpful than his brother when it comes to building, but he tends to do less destruction. 
when it comes to building, what do you prefer to do? You prefer to do the destruction part. He's quite good at helping me when I'm pulling stuff off the wall. I'm not sure if that's a good thing or a bad thing to start off with, but he does try. He does wear up. Anyway. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Melly6040. Thank you, Tanner Velika, Michael Coach. Thank you, Stafford. Thank you, Seneca Nero. Thank you, Tasha 2 Vachel. Thank you, Night6031. Thank you, Jack Ray and uh, Bijan and Gogo Atlanta and Sage and Alzaski. And thank you for everyone for your support. Thank you, Colin Cameron, Roland Cash. I think I've said that one. Ian Strain, thank you. PC with built in pastry warmer, a pastry warmer. Uh, built in Bicky hi hiding hole at the moment. And. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you. For, thank you for all the questions. Thank you, BCH. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, everyone, for all the questions. Hope you enjoyed this evening and um, take care. Thank you, Walt92. Thank you, Dirt Squad. And there appears to be a mighty fluff outside who's coming in to say goodbye as well. Hello. Hello. You've come in to say goodbye, have you? There I can't become. Right then. Hello. I came to say goodbye to him. Actually, I came to get my brother. Go! Have fun, you two. Right. They're off for the dinner. Take care, Dan. Thank you for showing up. Thank you, everyone. Take care and have fun.